So, hi, um, I'm Steve, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm uh, speaking uh, in English. Uh, I did actually uh, go to uh, a course on Charles de Leon, so I should, but that was in 93, so I'm a bit rusty. But uh, anyway, so what I'd like to talk about tonight is machine learning in the Elastic Stack. First of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about uh, um, where it came from, where the technology came from, then go into how that technology can be used uh, with Elasticsearch data. Then I'm going to give you some demos of the product uh, and finally go into a bit of a deep dive. I know we've got a technical audience, so uh, I can go into the technology and some of the things we do under the hood. So um, I'm currently uh, leading the machine learning group at Elastic. Um, I was formerly um, I was formerly founder and CTO of a company called Prelert that, that uh, I started back in 2010. Uh, and Elastic acquired that company and uh, the, the team uh, in uh, September 2016, uh, which is sort of a really exciting, and I think it's a really good fit uh, for both technologies. Um, originally, I was also uh, an academic at Imperial College, uh, doing uh, some large-scale computational mechanics problems, uh, and so on. So, um, really, just to start at a really high level, um, you know, Putting all this data into Elasticsearch isn't a huge amount of value unless you can actually get something useful out of it. And really, the, you know, the goal of um, you know, the, the Elasticsearch group and, and so on is to try and help you put this data in Elasticsearch, store this data at scale, but importantly, extract useful, valuable information from that data and insight from that data. And you know, as, as you've seen, you can search that data very quickly in sort of millisecond time, and I can look at user transactions for Steve in real time. I can do that at, uh, at very large scale. Aggregations are also great at uh, showing me the top 10 products or showing me uh, how things are trending over time uh, and so on. And with the visualizations as well, I can, I can look at the trend in my transactions or I can, I, can visualize, uh, I can visualize other aspects of my data and extract some useful information. But you know, when, you, when you think about the types of questions you, you might want to ask, so for instance, um, in, the, in the Content Square case, I might want to look at, well, which, um, which clients are behaving like botnets or which clients are behaving differently from other clients. And to answer those type of questions, really the, 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 the sort of what you need to do is to create some type of model, some type of statistical model of a client or of of that particular entity to, uh, to actually answer those type of questions. And really, you know, that's where we view that machine learning comes into the Elastic Stack as really just an, a, a way of, a way of uh, modeling your data to allow you to ask those type of questions. So you know, you've got these great inverted indexes, these column stores and so on, but, you, but really the statistical models that we can build and we can maintain in real time as the data is being streamed into Elasticsearch is sort of the type of, the type of thing that, that, uh, that we're building and the type of thing I'm going to present here. Okay, so we called the machine learning group. We were pre learned and we called the machine learning group. And uh, you know, machine learning is one of these overloaded terms that everyone in the industry or writing software is using at the moment. And it describes this really wide range of technologies. And um, we work with, a, with, a, with a, a group at MIT um, led up by Tommy Jackler. And um, you know, in terms of the landscape, there's obviously a lot going on. And just to be clear, you know, what we're trying to do is to help people um, who have data in Elasticsearch. And, 40 to 50% of the users who have data in Elasticsearch have timestamp data, have log data. Uh, and so where we're starting, and the, the sort of the first technology that we're building uh, in this space or have built in this space, is really focused on time series data. Now, if you've got search use cases or you've got non-time series data in there, we are going to be, uh, we are going to be building uh, technologies to help you do things like recommend products, etc. But at the moment, really, our focus is on uh, this time series uh, anomaly detection, detection area. And over time, we're going to be broadening out that. Our team is growing, uh, and so we're excited about uh, getting more into uh, a bigger space. OK, so really simple use case to start with. Uh, and this is actually um, a use case from a, a very large um, US retailer. And uh, we went into their their operations center and uh, their sort of IT 
operation center basically had about uh, about I think it was around 60 screens up on this big wall and a set of operators looking at it and what they had on those screens was a lot of metrics and really what the operators were looking at uh, was you know has something changed has one of these metrics that I'm looking at changed and sort of this is an obvious case of automation because you can only put so many things on a on a physical set of real estate in terms of screens and it'd be great if you could you know, not only analyze that automatically and alert when that changed uh, but also do that at scale so you could do that over many more metrics or many more logs than they can currently visualize but it's difficult because you know the analysts and the the IT operators were very used to the way the data behaved and they had a good instinct for how the data behaved and so really they understood that like on a, a Sunday or on a Saturday it might be different and it has some type of periodicity. So really that you know the first goal is can we create some sort of automated system that behind the scenes can learn models from past behavior uh, and using those models uh, be able to effectively uh, predict uh, the future behavior. So effectively, if we've learned what, uh, what typical behavior is based on historical characteristics, can we then calculate the probability of current behavior based on what we've seen historically? And with that probability, we can then do things like we can alert people, we can actually you know, do something like Slack them, message them, um, or feed that alert into, into ServiceNow or some other incident management system. And really sort of that's the, in this simple use case, that's the goal here, is as the data is being streamed in, um, we, we're not gonna tell our models anything about the data. We're gonna use unsupervised methods to automatically understand the data, understand if the data is periodic, understand the distributions we need to model the data with, and then calculate the probability as the data is being streamed in. Okay, so how this looks in the product is, is this big enough? Uh, okay. Okay, so, so this is the raw data. I've got six million transactions in here, uh, and uh, the transactions represent different things of different value. Uh, and you know, sort of here's the, that time chart um, displayed in Cabana. And you see that this, there's now uh, a new, a new uh, item here, which is machine learning. So if I open that up, um, what I'm going to do is, is create a, a job, and a job is really just a unit of work. Um, you know, what we, we, we're doing here is, is we're, you know, we're not just taking an arbitrary bit of data and finding anomalies in it, because if you do that, there's probably more anomalies, as many anomalies in the data as there is data. Yeah, so you have to target uh, this analysis at particular features in the data, such as the transaction rate. So if I create a job, I'm going to create a job um, based on this, this KPI data. I'm looking at the event rate. Um, and so this is, the, this is the data. So it's six million, six million transactions. Um, I'm then going to name, name this job and I'm, I'm then going to, uh, to actually run the analysis. So when I click this button, what's going to happen is that, that this machine learning plugin is actually now a native part of the cluster. So we're actually, this is all running on my laptop, but, uh, but effectively uh, the machine learning analytics are now part of the distributed cluster of Elasticsearch. I'm going to describe the architecture target architecture in a bit more detail later uh, but when I when I click this effectively we're going to go off we're going to do a, a make a query to, to, to Elasticsearch it's an aggregated query we, we, we work out the aggregations automatically uh, based on based on the input here we're then going to start streaming it through this plugin and we're going to start learning the normal behavior of this data so I don't know anything about the data on the left hand side there and you can imagine that this data is just being streamed into the system um, left to right uh, in temporal order as, as, it, as it goes in, and there's going to be a sort of a blue shaded line which represents our models as the, uh, as the, as the data goes across. Okay, so, um, so the analysis is running now, and you'll see on the left-hand side, yeah, we, haven't, we, have, we don't understand that the data is periodic, we don't understand the bounds of the data, so there's a big variance in terms of, um, in terms of where, the, uh, where the model is here. And then as we, look, as we see more data, you know, we, 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 we automatically learn that the data is periodic and we start fitting a lot tighter, tighter sort of set of baselines to it. And, uh, you know, we've identified anomalies in the data at, the, at these points and they're represented visually in this, uh, in this chart. And then if I drill into the results here, I can see that, you know, here's, here's a particular instance, uh, instance that we've, we've said is anomalous. 
and uh, and behind the scenes we said the probability of this uh, is 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 whatever 10 to minus 4 and we've got uh, um, you know the actual value is this and typically uh, the value is around here and so this is something that we're, we're saying is an anomaly so really that's sort of the, the most basic use case where we've we've uh, allowed you to select things that you're interested in uh, and we can automatically model them and note that we can, can then continue to do this in real time as the data is being streamed into Elasticsearch, we can continue to do this analysis in real time and we write our results back to Elasticsearch, which then allows you to use, use uh, alerting, uh, which was Watcher, to actually then, then uh, make, those, uh, make those alerts actionable. Okay, so very simple, but uh, you know, really the sort of the power of this type of technology comes when you want to look at like more than one thing. Um, and you know, here's another example from uh, the same customer who, who basically had a set of, a set of around 1,000 servers um, with uh, a lot of different performance metrics and log data being collected from those servers. And what they wanted to do was effectively sort of have some sort of view into the system which allowed them to understand if any of the servers were behaving unusually. Uh, so in this case, you know, they were trying to take multiple metrics um, analyze them, you know, and you can see that all the metrics here have pretty different characteristics. Automatically analyze those, uh, those metrics, uh, metri metrics in a multivariate sense and combine the results into some overall sort of pane of glass into the system to understand what was going on. Okay, so um, you know, what we can do is we can do a very similar thing here where we take, a, we take, instead of just a single metric, we can take multiple metrics. In this case, I'm, I'm gonna be looking at uh, a set of services and uh, this time, you know, the data is arranged so effectively, it's a uh, it's a set of um, the da the data, the raw data, <coughs> looks like. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the, the raw data effectively looks like this, where I've got a service name and a response time from that service, and I've got that for multiple services. So effectively, what I want to do here is analyze those multiple services, analyze all those separate metrics independently, then bubble up the results uh, into a, an overall, uh, overall score across all those metrics. Okay, so now when I create the job, instead of just analyzing one metric, we're analyzing all those metrics concurrently uh, and, um, and, we're, and, uh, and effectively we're then combining the results in a multivariate sense um, up into a, into, a, into a pane of glass which, uh, which represents uh, the overall anomalousness of the system as a whole. Okay, and then um, when we view the results here, you'll see that uh, you know, overall there was an anomaly at this point and we then display we then display below that the, uh, the services that were anomalous. We see that there was a specific service here, um, this inventory service that was an anomalous at that point. Yeah. So we can then start scaling out the analysis across more and more metrics, partitioned by different things like host or service or user or client, etc. Okay. So, so um, no, that's great for metrics, but uh, what about log data? Um, and you know, obviously, one of the, the, the sort of the, the big use cases for Elasticsearch is log data. Um, if log data is structured, that's great uh, because we can use event rates using very similar manner to to, uh, to the, the last analysis in terms of looking at event rate uh, partitioned by a particular service or host. But if the log data is unstructured, there's actually a, an additional piece of technology we have which can automatically. Uh, um, cluster and classify the log data into different types and then run anomaly detection on that. So, you know, in this case, ideally what I want to do is find, well, can you tell me, are there any unusual messages? Um, or are there any um, particular messages that increase in event rate significantly compared to historical values? And it would be great if, if I could do something like this. If I could take the data, I could then... Uh, you know, classify it into these different types of messages based on string similarity, uh, and then uh, and then run effectively a normally detection on those to to uh, to separate the normal log messages from the unusual log messages. 
and uh, you know this just sort of brings me into uh, the next uh, the next uh, bit that I hadn't shown you in the in the product yet, um, which is which is all around uh, this advanced job creation. And there's a load of things that we can do in here that uh, that I'm more than happy to go 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 through go through offline, where we can actually start looking at the profiles of entities. Um, how one user is behaving differently to another user in a multi-dimensional sense and so on. But for these log messages, I'm just going to create a job called log messages. The configuration in this case, um, I'm going to categorize. So my, 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 I'm going to basically cluster the messages according to the field message. I'm then going to look at counts of this ML category, which is the, the derived field that, uh, that uh, we've, uh, we've derived based on message. And I'm going to basically look at the results by, by a host at the end of it. So when I start the data feed here, you'll see that um, I can start at the beginning of the data and I can either continue to run this in real time or I can specify just run up to a single point and do it historically. Okay, so when I run this through, there's not a huge number of messages here. When I view the results, I can see that there's an anomaly here, and this points to these unusual log messages that, that I haven't having, had in the data. And if I look at the, uh, the raw data, I'll go back to the Discover tab, Effectively, if you look at the data here, I mean, you can see, see that uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty difficult to point out, well, what is the normal log messages in here and what are the unusual log messages in here? And we've effectively categorized these messages and, uh, and identified those, those rare messages in the data. Okay, so you know, what we can then do is, for an IT system as a whole, if you've got a set of analyses, we can combine them in this view to show you overall what's going on. Uh, so in this case, I've combined all those analyses, I've combined the service information, the KPI information, and the messages overall into this view, which shows me sort of overall what, what's going on in the system uh, and what's anomalous at this particular point in time. Okay. Okay, and as I said, you know, we can also look at things like unusual entities. So we can start doing analyses where we look at, okay, for this particular entity, typically it behaves like this, and here's an entity that's behaving like this. We can calculate the probability of this automatically, uh, and then, uh, then alert you when you have these unusual entities. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that we, did, uh, we did a similar analysis for content now as well. Okay, so what's going on under the hood? Um, and I think, you know, as I said, I've got a technical audience, so I'd like to just go into a bit of the maths behind what we're doing and uh, some, of the, some of the sort of the modeling that we're doing and some of the challenges you have, because often people go, well, I can just do mean two standard deviations uh, and that, that should be fine. But I mean, the problem is that once you start looking at arbitrary data and you want to be robust to arbitrary data, then you need to take into account um, you know, some of the complexities in the data, such as you know, the distributions that fit the data, the, the periodicity and seasonality in the data, uh, and also the changes in the data and how you decay out old models as new things come in in real time. So if I just take a very simple example, and this is a, a stationary univariate example, so stationary meaning, meaning that, uh, meaning that uh, it, it doesn't really change behavior in, uh, as, you know, in a temporal sense like a periodic signal. Um, and in this case, really, you know, what we're trying to do when we model this is, uh, is fit that histogram, um, which, which, uh, which, uh, which, you know, which, which is actually sort of just a histogram of the data there. We're trying to find a parametric function, um, a probability distribution that can, that, can, that can fit that. And as you can see that if I just use a normal distribution, which is when you use uh, sort of two and a half standard deviations or two standard deviations, then you, know, you end up with a lot of false negatives 
and a lot of false positives because the tails of a normal distribution <laughs> are very thin and uh, don't really match the fat tail of the standard distributions you get in, get in, uh, get in, get in machine data. So really what we want to do is to try and automatically learn the distributions that we fit, that fit in the data. And if you look at actually what the product's doing under the hood here, here are the actual distributions that we're, we're learning um, in a Bayesian sense as the data is being streamed through us. So we're starting with non-informative priors on the left-hand side, and as we see more data, uh, we're up updating those priors with the, with, with the information that we've seen. With, 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 with the information we've seen, and you can see that the model model becomes going from a quite a wide a wide tailed sort of a multimodal dis a, a wide tailed mixture distribution to a multimodal distribution at this point when we've seen enough data to understand that actually this type of distribution fits the data data better. And if if you don't model data with this type of uh, this type of accuracy, uh, you know you end up quite often with those false negative and false positive uh, occurrences. Okay, so the problem is that that is a, very, is a stationary signal, and generally data fits this type of model. Uh, and really, you know, when we have seasonal data, it's not as simple as just fitting a single distribution, but you know, we really, if we're trying to predict a value at that point, we're not interested in that red stuff. We're really interested in the stuff in the middle here, which represents the, the relevant historical points to the, to the prediction we're going to make here. And that means that we also have to automatically learn trends in the data, uh, and not just necessarily just a, a simple periodic trend, but there may be a long-term trend like, uh, like this exhibits and so on. Uh, and you know, really what we're trying to do with the, this product is shrink wrap all those capabilities and all that sort of statistical knowledge um, and to empower you to just simply run it using that simple job wizard that, uh, that uh, I, showed, I showed at the beginning. Okay. So, um, how it fits into Elasticsearch, and you know, this is something that's sort of quite exciting because before we were bought by Elastic, we were in a different position because we were sort of sat on the side of Elastic, and when we wanted to do this analysis of data, we had to query Elastic, stream the data back to us. We then had to do our analyses and then push the data back, back, uh, back, back, back to uh, to Elastic. And you know, we had problems with that in that you know, we had to be often deployed on different hardware. Um, the, you know, data gravity is a big thing. And you know, the more you can do in the cluster, the better. So the, the, you know, the less you have to move the data, data out of the cluster, the less load you, load you put on the system as a whole. Also, um, you know, you, everyone wants their, their anomalies displayed across the raw data. They want the whole context of what's going on in the same view. And uh, if you've got a separate system, it's quite difficult to do that. Uh, and then, you know, finally, you know, at Prelo, we, we, we had a way of scaling beyond a single instance, but it was difficult. It was very manual. And Elasticsearch is, is built from the start to be uh, horizontally scalable. And, you know, what we've done in our integration is we've piggybacked on that. So when you run this type of analysis, we actually distribute the analytics across the, the, the cluster as well, um, making use of uh, free CPU and memory resource that's available in the cluster. And then finally, when nodes fail, um, you know, we're, we're also resilient to that because we're piggybacking on the Elastic Stack as well. So uh, just as a just as sort of a, a you know, obviously we're we're. We're part of XPAC, so um, you know, this is something that you can trial for free, but it's actually part of the, the Platinum subscription with XPAC, and I'll talk about that at the end as well. But in terms of what's actually going on in terms of the, the Elasticsearch architecture, um, you know, the master is the thing that, that orchestrates this whole, uh, this whole thing in the same way that it orchestrates uh, indexing or, um, or other operations as well. So effectively, there's two operations that we do. Now, one is we create these jobs, and two is we ask the Elasticsearch cluster to take, send us data. So you know, creating a job is something that the master orchestrates, and you can say which nodes you want to run machine learning on. So if you have a set of data critical nodes, they may not be the ones you want to run you know, the mach machine learning on. You may want to maintain the resource of those solely for, solely for indexing and data access. Uh, and typically, um, you know, we recommend maybe maybe a sort of a, you know a tenth of a tenth of uh, the number of nodes nodes you have um, be allocated 
to, uh, to, uh, to doing this depending on, depending on the load you're going to be putting on the system. But effectively, when you create a job, the master is going to orchestrate that and allocate which node to, to run the job on. And then it's also going to uh, orchestrate where to, to create the data feed. And the data feed and the, uh, and the job are linked, uh, are linked uh, via this, uh, this mechanism. Um, now the, 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 really, the really cool thing is that you know, the master can also load balance across the nodes that you, that you have available. So as more jobs are created, as more jobs are opened, um, we balance those across the available resource. Uh, and we also write that back to, uh, to, to Elasticsearch as search as an index. And sort of like importantly, if a node stops, that's something that the master node, but because the master is in control of this and everything's stored in cluster state, uh, we then enumerate uh, which nodes are available and we re reassign that job and we restart, from where, we, we restart from where it left off. Okay, so current status is we're, we're in sort of hectic development at the moment, we, we've, we've got feature freeze of the product and so we're, we're just going through sort of final testing uh, and uh, it's planned for release on May the 2nd. Uh, and then uh, that, that's, that's going to be a beta release. And I think the main reason it's, uh, it's a beta release is because it involves a lot of code churn. Um, there's been a lot uh, added to Elasticsearch and to the ML product to, uh, you know, to, to enable this. And so we're planning to then make it GA available in, la in late June. Okay, sorry I rushed through that a bit, uh, but more than happy to answer any, any, any questions. <laughs> 